The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Aloha. Hey, guys. hey Buddy, what's going on, man? Buddy. Just chilling. How is everyone? Good, 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 good. good, good. Uh, day, day two of Finny Forum. It's been, it's been a nice scene. Right now, Seth is talking. So I think actually Finny Forum is streaming live too. So I assume some people are tuning into that right yeah. now, which is, which is very cool. Okay. Uh, but yeah, things, things um, are good, man. What's Seth talking about? We don't know. <laughs> it just said Seth for privacy. Yeah, yeah. We have a topic, so no one I has, assume it's, it's probably it's a a privacy related. Hopefully. I don't know if he's presenting on um, foundation or if he's just doing his own own talk, but yeah. But we've we've run into you know a lot of, a lot of the familiar faces from an era, uh, so it's it's been really cool. We all went out to dinner last night. That was amazing. Yeah. Um, yep. it's, it's been really Jake nice. Wallet, yeah. So that was yeah, that was really awesome. Yep. How you doing, man? How's how's price looking these days? Oh, it's just chilling. Uh, you can see Monero's price right here. It's just it's basically flat. You know, doing the same thing that we did before the run up started. Um, got a few a few new things to show you guys. Um, let's see. On YouTube, it says we got 24 watching, but we only got two likes. Smash that like, guys. I'm not going to tell you what price is going to do until we get like at least two more. Likes. <laughs> <laughs> if you want, if you want mad gains, smash the like. See you. <laughs> All right, do it. All right, All right. I'm gonna. Um, okay, so we got Monero. Yeah, we're gonna mute ourselves. I'm gonna mute myself ourselves. Okay. Oh man, we're gonna lose the soundtrack. <laughs> okay, so um, we've got Monero's price here. Hasn't really done too much, right? Uh, we we smashed to the downside, um, came back up to basically the uh, the bands here, the uh, the long term, or the, sort of the medium, like the two year, three year standard deviation bands. So we're really just hanging out in there. Um, you know, at some point we're going to break out of that. I think the fact that even the delisting down here failed to permanently bring us out of these bands, I think that's a really good sign that ultimately we will eventually smash to the upside. Um, who knows when that's going to happen, um, right? Sometimes organic adoption can move price uh, significantly and it, and it could just happen um, without warning. So, um, and or perhaps, you know, some big entity ends up with some need for Monero. Um, or they want to try and accumulate more of their bags. In fact, it, in with regards to big entities trying to accumulate Monero, um, it does seem like the pattern now here is for bear markets, when everything is quiet and everyone's fearful and, and the hype is in, I think these big entities do try to accumulate Monero in the bear market um, when they can get it cheaper and without pumping the price, um, especially you know if there's people like that are sort of panic selling. And then during the bull markets, like the broad crypto bull markets, they sell Monero onto the market. They try and keep that price managed. My guess is that's what we've seen here. That's basically what happened um, over the past couple of years. And um, I can prove it. <laughs> I can prove it. So let's take a look really quick here at the big chart. This is Monero versus Bitcoin. Um, and you'll notice that basically we're uh, this. This is still, so you can see we're we're making lower lows, right? Um, continually making slightly lower lows. This is accumulation zone. From a technical analysis perspective, this is an accumulation zone. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, oops, I, um, there we go. Okay, so the reason for that is you've got the RSI down here and you can see that the RSI, which is the purple, the yellow is like the moving average. I don't even know why I have the yellow on there. Let's actually just take that off. Uh, Let's make the purple yellow because it looks better. All right, hopefully you can see that. Oh, you know what? I almost forgot to zoom in. Okay, so I'm going to try and zoom in these charts. I feel like YouTube doesn't necessarily give us the best resolution, so hopefully this is slightly more visible. Um, effectively, what we've got here is the RSI is making higher lows, right? So on the XMR BTC chart, the RSI is in an uptrend, whereas the price is still technically in this downtrend. That's called bullish divergence, and in a technical sense, you would look at that and you would say, hey, um, that is a, that's a bullish signal, right? That's a bottoming signal. So the other reason that we might suspect um, that XMR BTC is in this accumulation zone is effectively this orange band here is a lifetime lower standard deviation. Um, technically, it's actually the, um, uh, the geometric standard deviation for any of you math geniuses out there. Um, what you do is you take the log of price, you calculate the standard deviation, and then you take the exponent of that result. 
um, and it gives you a different result. In fact, when you're dealing with exponential charts, you often take geometric means or a geometric average and by, you know, as a corollary, the, the geometric standard deviation. Anyways, if that doesn't make any sense to you, just trust me, bro. Um, this is a lower standard deviation and we're basically touching it. So we are in accumulation zone here. Um, not everything is perfectly rosy with the XMR BTC chart. However, um, just from a technical analysis, you would you would look at this and say, yeah, that's that's accumulation territory. Um, there is one more thing that I wanted to show you guys when I was like, hey, I can prove it that um, <laughs> that uh, that Monero was basically anti-correlated to um, cryptocurrency um, bull markets. Right here, what we're looking at is a correlation analysis. So I'll show you guys how to do it, actually. Um, for now, let's just go to the RSI. That's not important. So what we've got here is the um, is the XMR BTC chart. You know, we'll we'll delete that as well, so I can show you how to do this. So um, if you like hot keys, if you like quick keys, press the slash, the forward slash button, and that will bring up your indicators and metrics. And what you can do is just type core for correlation. Hey, why won't it work? Correlation analysis. All right. So of course it's not going to work. That's really weird. Am I misspelling correlation? Is is that what's going on here? All right. That's really weird. That that shouldn't happen. All right, well, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to undo. Man, I don't know why TradingView likes to do weird stuff sometimes. I'm sure I'm probably doing something wrong. Okay, anyways, it that should pop up there. I don't know why it wouldn't pop up. Like, it always just pops up with correlation analysis. Technicals. Man, that's really weird. <clears throat> it should say correlation analysis down there. Uh, all right, whatever. This is a correlation analysis down here. It tells you how correlated price is to something else. So what you can do is you tell it, what do you want to look at? What do you want to correlate to? So it's taking this chart up here, which is the XMR BTC ratio, and it's dividing it by whatever you choose. So we're basically choosing the total cryptocurrency market cap, right? Because that's our biggest, um, that's our biggest uh, like broad view into, God, nothing is working. Now it just disappeared. Hang on, we're going to try one more thing. All right, that's that's why that wouldn't that wasn't working. Uh, okay. No. All right. Sorry to keep the show like slightly held up here. A anyways, um, this correlation analysis tells us when it's positive one, it means that this chart up here is correlated positively with the asset on the bottom. So we're comparing against total. So when we're at a correlation of one, that means that XMR BTC, our price relative to Bitcoin. That would mean that it's correlated positively. So if the market is going up, that means that XMR BTC is going up. But what you'll notice here is that we're on the negative side, right? Here's the zero point, and we're on the negative side since, I mean, with a couple little um, blips here and there, effectively since August of last year, or sorry, August of 2022, right? So since August of 2022, for a year and a half now, Monero's price has been negatively correlated with the total cryptocurrency market pa uh, market cap, or I should say the Monero Bitcoin ratio has been negatively correlated with total crypto market cap. So, I mean, this is like your proof right here. This is effectively, it, it's in a chart, shows you exactly what I'm talking about, that during bear markets, Monero's relative price to Bitcoin performs better, and during bull markets, it performs worse. That's not an accident. It's done on purpose. It's done the same reasons that the cabal suppresses the gold price. So... Um, there's probably not too many charts that look like that. Maybe there's a couple I haven't looked for them. So if uh, any of you astute observers out there are looking at different charts, feel free to send them my way. Um, if you, if you see anything, if you find anything interesting, um, you can also look at the XMR, uh, market cap dominance, right? And this compares not just against Bitcoin, it compares against the entire market cap. And you'll notice that effectively we're in a bull market. We've been going down steadily, right? We've been, we've been dumping price here. Um, it pisses me off. I'm not going to lie. It, it really, really, uh, really pisses me off that that's, that's how things are. But hey, that's, I mean, it is what it is, right? Um, let's see. I didn't get around to publishing the, um, the divergences, uh, the, the Monero price divergences for the different exchanges. Um, one reason is that, um, well, I haven't had time, but the other reason is that I want to fix the volume calculation on this because a lot of the volume is done in USDT, right? Monero versus the USDT pair as opposed to USD. Um, and I need to really include all of the different volumes that are in there. And so I'm not confident that I'm doing that, especially since um, since the Binance delisting, right? A lot of that volume, allegedly, right? Not that I exactly trust the volume numbers, but allegedly a lot of that volume went to Qcoin and um, and I think MexC. Um, guys, I, I'm going to put a warning out here again. Do not fucking trade much 
like hardly anything through MEXC. They are the new Binance. They will surprise KYC. Um, I had a friend. They did this too uh, in the past week. They will they will surprise KYC you, and who knows if you get your money back. Do not use MEXC unless it's for very small amounts, okay? Like, <laughs> y'all shouldn't be doing it anyways. I don't think probably many of you are, but please, for the love of God, for the love of your own funds, don't use that fucking exchange. Um, Qcoin is slightly better. I've heard far fewer things about them, negative things about them, but um, but I've heard a lot of negative things about MEXC, and now, um, just like with Binance, now I have a personal, a personal friend that that actually happened to. So don't use these guys. Bad scumbag pieces of shit. All right, that's enough for um, talking shit talking exchanges. Um, and here's the XMR Ethereum ratio. Same story as the XMR BTC ratio, making lower lows on the price. Um, the RSI uh, is making higher lows. Uh, let's see if the fucking RSI will come up. All right, at least one indicator finally worked. Yeah, so you can see the RSI down here is making higher lows. And from a technical analysis perspective, this is Monero um, making a bottoming pattern. Um, this is Monero uh, in, a, in an accumulation zone. <clears throat> now we have to temper that that um you know are we really in an accumulation zone we have to temper that with the rest of our market analysis right because you don't want to look at one isolated ta thing monero against some charts and be like all right that's the answer you need to look at the broad picture right so we need to look at the rest of the crypto market and really decide for ourselves is this thing getting close to a top is there is there a massive bull run are we about to hit fi you know five hundred thousand dollar price of bitcoin are we even going to hit a hundred thousand dollars who knows right um, I'm seeing all the retard predictions come out of the woodwork again, and it's like, okay, it, it, listen, guys. And and then I challenge them. I'm like, well, why do you think that? And they're like, well, you know, we've been making higher highs, and we broke new all-time highs, so a million-dollar Bitcoin. <laughs> if you get just, – just like for the listeners out there, if you're going to make a price prediction, at least have, like, something behind it. Like, have a reason for the number that you're saying, especially if it's, like, some ridiculously outlandishly high number, like, <laughs> like 400 – Five hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin, right? We've almost got a ten x to get there. Uh, we, I guess, we need like to do a six x or somewhere between like a six x and a nine x to get to actually half a million dollars is, is what we would need at this point, um, or, or to get to four hundred thousand dollars. So, um, again, like just it, you're doing a disservice to your friends and your family if you're just quoting them these massively ridiculously high prices and you have no reason for thinking that, like no specific reasons for that specific number. Um, so. But yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at the overall crypto market cap, uh, or uh, we'll start with Bitcoin, actually. So um, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin is still kind of doing this thing. You'll notice that we we basically set new all-time highs. The tippity top would be like 74,000, just above, or sorry, uh, almost 74,000. Um, that little like attempt that I tried to draw the other day, uh, last week, on like a rising wedge, that looks like it's broken down, but honestly, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, these charts are still quite bullish. One, one thing that... Um, one thing that gives me pause here to think that we might be in for a little bit longer of a pullback than people would prefer is let's go down to the one hour. Um, it's the purple lines. We need to go down to the one hour so that you guys can see them um, better. Although I'm not sure how I, I know sometimes like I, I check out the videos here and it's like it's hard to see um, the wave magic line. So hopefully y'all can see that. Um, maybe zoom in one more notch here, a couple more notches. Um, so one thing that happens, it's very common, I notice, when you get a breakout, you'll notice the very short-term um, purple bands come to the upside. You'll usually break it to the top side a little bit. They'll level off, sort of establish. You'll actually touch it or very closely touch it. And then at some point, you'll try to make another touch, and you just won't be able to. You flatten out. You'll notice that like the blue bands, the short-term upper standard deviations, they start to flatten out. And then when that happens, you're usually in for some kind of pullback. So it wouldn't be unreasonable at this point to try and touch these lower purple bands here um, or the lower standard deviation, kind of set some kind of floor, maybe even like a fake out wick to the bottom before continuing to the upside. So um, right now, I would look at this chart just from a TA perspective and say, hey, um, you know, maybe this needs some a cool off period before we really before we really try to move any higher. Now, in a longer sense, in a longer term sense, you'll see that this, this orange line that I've drawn here, it, it's basically kind of like a, a hand-drawn forecast of, of what we might expect um, uh, these purple bands here to do. And again, I, I want to show you guys, these purple bands are formed from the previous all-time high action that happened in uh, at the end of 2021. Um, so, right, these two tops, these purple bands are are like... They're kind of like an exponential version of uh, the moving standard deviation. They move much more quickly. Um, they allow you to sort of capture um, exponential moves and have a way of analyzing them. 
Um, I invented them actually because believe it or not, the stock market is so exponential over the long term that upper standard deviations don't even work. The stock market almost always stays above the upper standard deviations. Um, it'll kind of like bounce off of them. And every now and then, like we did for the past couple of years, it'll actually have some kind of bear market. Uh, but anyways, these purple bands have been very useful for me as a means of just kind of um, referencing what the market's doing. And shockingly, um, especially with new trends like this, they're often very, very accurate. Um, I've been shocked at how accurate they can be sometimes. So the point is that... Um, where I'm really looking to a touch of these purple bands is where I'll be looking for a top. Um, I'll probably be selling a lot of uh, my altcoin positions. I'll be looking for some kind of reversal. Again, that's tentative, right? When we get there, I want to see what the rest of the macro situation looks like. I want to see like the totality of the markets, but um, you know that would be a target, right? Kind of like how these these upper these upper standard deviation levels for for quite a while on the way up. I said, hey, these are my target. This is where I'll start getting nervous. Um, and you'll notice that for about three months there, it was about, it was about three months where um, they actually did act as a very good resistance um, until, until we actually started breaking out of them. So um, at this moment, I'll be looking at these bands uh, as a target. I think that's a very, very natural target for the Bitcoin price. Um, so for the meantime, though, I think there's probably a little bit of consolidation that might need to happen here. You can see it's sort of already happening. Um, has been happening for the past week. But I mean, the reality is Bitcoin price is still at $68,000, right? So that's, I mean, that's pretty good, right? It's, it's not really, that's hardly any consolidation at all. Um, let's take a look. You know, those of us that have been here for a long time remember that, that sometimes you go down 30 or 40% in a bear market before going back up. So if we were to go down 30 or 40% from the top here, right, that would put us at like 40 or 45,000. So you know, it's it's just this is just a pause here for the moment. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that this is enough for people to to start getting nervous and say that hey, it's you know the run is over. Um, it's probably not quite over. Uh, let's take a look at the total crypto market cap, um, which I think is a little bit of a cleaner chart, and you can even see it in in kind of the way that things really did a good job of just kind of obeying these um, the sort of rising upper standard deviation lines. And then now again, I mean, same story as Bitcoin, right? Like the whole market, I mean, Bitcoin is half the market cap here anyways. So half of this chart is Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically taking a pause here. This, it would be actually very bullish if this thing just stopped and things just started continuing up right here. It's difficult for me to believe that, that this is the bottom of this pullback. My guess is that the pullback has further to go. So that's total crypto market cap. I wanted to show y'all something, uh, basically a fractal. I wanted to show you guys um, a fractal on the BTC price. So this is back in 2021. Let's see here. Okay, so you'll notice, you'll notice the dates down here. Like, look at the bottom of the screen. You'll see that that's um, that's 2021 from the summer, right when the summer crash happened. And then the run up all the way into the all time high here at the end of 2021. So one thing you can do is go onto the left side and one, two, three, four, five things down. Um, it's I guess let's see what it's called the forecasting, forecasting and measurement tools. Okay, so you'll go into these forecast and measurement tools, and this thing is called bars pattern. Now I want y'all to be very, very, very careful with this indicator, and I don't want y'all to think that there's like fractals everywhere and that you're like finding the patterns and the code right? Uh, like Rain Man or, <laughs> or a Beautiful Mind or, or whatever. But what you can do, click that button, and then you'll choose some starting location, and then you'll choose an ending location. And you'll notice what happens here is you get the exact bars pattern, okay? That's what this is. Now, I've already taken the liberty of moving that over because otherwise we'd have to slide and then slide, whatever. We're not going to do that. I've already moved it over here. And this is pretty dubious, right? This is always a dubious thing to do. Um, humans will find patterns that look like other patterns and say, hey, look at that pattern. There's actually a mathematical way to determine how closely matched a pattern is. I'm going to tell you right now that this is not a very closely matched pattern, but um, it is interesting. It has similar feels to someone out there laughing at, uh, at, at doing things that are dubious. Um, it does have kind of a similar feel. So one thing you'll notice, you can sort of uh, stretch and expand this, right? So what we're going to do is, is expand this. Um, kind of into the top here, um, maybe we don't like, maybe it's, it's kind of arbitrary, right? It, it is a bit arbitrary to just say, okay, how much do you want to expand it or contract it? Um, but there is a little bit of a similar feel here as there was to that last run up in, um, in 2021. So hypothetically, we could do something like this, right? We'll put the first peak there. We just peaked out at the all time high. Um, and then we'll sort of put that bottom peak down there. 
it's interesting. Uh, I just wanted to look at it. Like, I, I don't really have too much commentary on it. It does kind of feel similar, right? Your eyeballs will find this sort of, okay, you had this big run up, you had this pullback, and then uh, kind of this violent move to the upside. And now we're having this pullback here. I'll be curious to watch this and see what happens. Again, guys, don't use this. Don't trade off this. Don't don't, don't be like uh, Charlie Day with the map behind you and like, oh my God, I've, I've got the exact fractal pattern, you know, and then say fractal everywhere because it's such a cool word to say, um, right? This is just like one little thing to look at to be like, okay, maybe maybe this is significant. Maybe there's something here. Um, okay, hypothetically, maybe maybe we look at this and, and look towards the end of March here, um, somewhere around the $60,000 area to, to finish this sort of pullback and then maybe try to make another run to the top side. Um, again, 80K is like a tentative target. Those purple lines are actually slightly above 80K, so it will probably be more like 82K would be my would be the place, like a very prominent place in my mind to be looking at. Uh, Bitcoin dominance is uh, just chilling, right? It's not really doing anything. Um, uh, as I've said for kind of many months, I don't have any opinions on what this chart does or where it goes. Um, over the long term, so in the short term, uh, but over the long term, um, I do. I have been expecting Ethereum to gain market cap parity. Now that Bitcoin has NFTs and BRC twenties and all the degeneracy, it's like that's that's a place to squeeze some juice, right? That's a place to put people through the ringer and to make money. That's going to steal some of the Ethereum market cap that that is allocated for those sort of things. Now, don't get me wrong. Doing all that on Bitcoin is is retarded and and, and inefficient in every way possible. Um, they have no DEXs. They've got no stablecoin liquidity there that you can spin it out of. Um, BRC20 tokens don't actually do anything. Like if you say that Ethereum ERC20 tokens don't actually do anything, which is wrong, they do. Uh, but there's a lot of them that don't. Probably most of it doesn't do anything. But if that's true for Ethereum that they don't do much, then like it's even more true for Bitcoin. They do even less on there. Nevertheless, it doesn't exactly matter, right? Like that, that doesn't matter. Remember, markets are, are irrational, but they're predictably irrational. So there's going to be some level of market cap stolen from Ethereum. It's going to be harder for Ethereum to gain market cap parity this cycle. I still think the probabilities are that it will, but I've had to adjust my probabilities ever since all that degeneracy hit the, hit the main chain on Bitcoin. I've had to, to adjust my sort of internal mental probabilities of that happening. I still think it's probably going to happen. Um, it will probably be driven by the ETF, right? At some point, um, it'll be start become clear that the ETF will be approved. Probably it will be approved. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. Maybe they'll like do the whole court battle thing, you know, where you've got to sue Gary Gensler again to be like, yo, you're arbitrary and capricious, bro. Please include the Ethereum ETF. And he's like rubbing his hands because he knows like he knows what he's doing. He always intended to approve the Bitcoin ETF. They always intended to do two separate ETFs where they did the uh, the futures ETF and then they did the real spotty. They always intended to do that. It's maximum opportunity for maximum news hype cycle to take money off plebs, like to 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 sell as much as they can at the top. Like he knows what he's doing. He's part of that game. He was at MIT talking about the goodness of crypto for years before he got into the position that he's in now. So he's an insider. He absolutely knows what he's doing. Okay. But in terms of the dominance here, I mean, I, listen guys, when we see, if, and when we see this dominance crash down to the bottom, maybe uh, hell, maybe it could even hit these lines down here. If we see altcoins make a major run, that's a, that's a big warning sign. That's a huge flashing warning sign. If we see altcoins, because we've seen some nice moves in some altcoins. Some of them have significantly outperformed Bitcoin. Soul is one. Um, I think, I think Link and AVAX are still outperformers on Bitcoin from the bottom, from their, from their local bottoms, although um, Bitcoin is equalized a lot. But the point is that if we see a broad altcoin run, I'm going to be looking at that and saying, you know, um, maybe we're getting a little bit uh, long in the tooth here, so to speak. Um, maybe we're, maybe, maybe this run um, needs some larger pullback more than just like, you know, a 10 or 20%. Um, I really am at some point, I still... Maybe it's a pipe dream at this point. <laughs> Maybe it's a pipe dream and we're going to hit the upper boundary now before we hit the lower boundary. But I still would like to hit this lower boundary at some point, right? I would still, it could happen in September. It could happen at the end of 2025. But I would still like to hit somewhere around twenty-five to $30,000 on the Bitcoin price. One big final washout, one big... Um, Maybe a demand destroying event, you know, a tail risk event. Crypto, um, crypto goes down when the rest of the market tanks. So I, I would still be looking for that. Um, but the more that price goes up, right, the harder it is for me to hold out hope for that kind of for that kind of washout. So um, which, again, is like that's my as I've said so many times before, my strategy here since August was like, 
Um, my balance of probabilities was down in August, but then I set some levels and said, if the market passes these levels, I'm going to have to get off of that bearish thesis. And I took insurance plays that should outperform and they've done quite well for me. Um, and I've still got a big stack just waiting to buy if we have a major crash. That's kind of been my, um, that's kind of been like my playbook, my strategy. Um, and you know, I was talking with a friend about this, um, in the past week or so, and um, he was kind of asking me, okay, well, what could we have done better, you know, in the past year? Like what, um, you know, what were mistakes you made and, and whatnot? And, and what mistakes, what, what do you see mistakes that I made? And I said, well, when the market did something I didn't expect, when it, when it went the opposite direction that I was looking for, it told me, hey, I'm wrong about the markets right now. And he's, you know, like, even though price crossed thresholds that forced me off of a bear thesis and really into a bull thesis, um, I wasn't willing to buy because in my mind, it was like, Okay, I'm wrong about the markets, and now for me to chase into markets when I was wrong about them in August, that would be like that's a mistake, right? You, if I don't know what's going on and I don't have a good beat on the markets, why should I put money at risk? That that seems to be just like a, a bad bad money management. I said I've got these insurance plays; they should keep me good, um, and they have, which is which has been nice, um, you know. But I definitely left some money on the table by not chasing the markets earlier last year. I'm comfortable with that. Um, everyone has to kind of decide their own um, personal strategy. Uh, I'm totally comfortable with that. Um, to me, I like the Warren Buffett rule number one, don't lose money, right? If you're going to trade these markets, your rule number one is don't lose money. Um, when you lose and you lose big, it's hard for, to come back from that. You either have to wait a long time to get there um, or you have to take bigger risk to get back. And taking bigger risk after losing money is how you lose even more money. So um, anyways, um, just a little bit of self-reflection there for you guys today on this lovely Saturday morning. Um, Let's go ahead and close off with the macro. Not too much, um, not too much to talk about. I actually want to start with um, with unemployment numbers uh, and any inflation numbers because we got um, we got new unemployment numbers uh, before the show last week, and I just forgot to show them to you guys. So one thing with the unemployment that's really this is going this chart is going to become very prominent in my mind as the months go by. So if you guys remember during the bear market, it was the the uh, the CPI and the PPI numbers that was like the headline thing that uh, that we were looking at because that was going to guide when basically when the Federal Reserve was done raising rates and every time they were raising rates um, the market took that pretty negatively so we were looking for the Ford guidance to end on the CPI numbers the inflation numbers well that hasn't mattered for a long time and although we cover it it's like it's you know it's it's not that big a deal um, and the Fed meetings also have been were a big deal at that time but now they just like they don't matter that much. Um, they might start mattering if the Fed starts lowering or starts forward guiding us into the lowering moments. Um, but the chart that's going to start becoming present in my mind to identify tail risk, um, and tail risk is like, tail risk means that it's the edges of that bell curve. Like it's a very, very low probability, but when it happens, it's like, you know, you lose 40% in a month, <laughs> With, which for crypto we're used to, but stocks, stocks aren't used to that, right? That only happens to stocks once a decade or once every couple decades. Um, so the thing is that this this unemployment chart has actually been correlated significantly with tail risk events. And once the unemployment starts climbing, usually it kind of runs away from you. So we'll take a little bit of a backwards look here. You'll notice here, um, 2006, right, the unemployment uh, bottomed out and then it jumped back up and it's like, OK, whatever. That's just like a, a few ticks up. Right. How do you know that this tick up isn't a big deal? Um, it jumped up, it flattened out. And now we're looking at 2007. Now we're looking at December of 2007. And then 2008 starts, and this thing has already come up quite a significant amount, right? From uh, basically from 4.3, 4.3.5% all the way up to 5.1%. Now, these numbers are delayed by a month and a half, right? So every tick of these numbers that you get, you actually have to go forwards um, just a little bit because you didn't, um, we actually don't get, so for example, let me show you here. Um, we didn't get the February 1st numbers, right? We didn't get the, the numbers for the unemployment um, for the month of, I actually don't know if this is for the month of February. I think it's for the month of January. We didn't get this number until like um, the first week of March. So we're delayed by like five or six weeks here. Anyways, the point is that as we go back, you'll notice. So here's the dot-com uh, bubble. And then again, you'll notice at the very end of 2000, unemployment jumps up and then it keeps jumping up all the way into um, into like March and April of 2001. It was March and April of 2001 that the major crash really started happening. So well, the point is that when this chart starts to move up, and not just like one tick, it moves up, it holds, it moves up again, maybe it pulls back, and then it continues on going, um, that's, that becomes a really ominous sign. Now, you'll notice here in 2021, that just smashed to the upside. There was no early warning signal here 
Um, obviously, that was for the uh, related events that we can't talk about because um, they'll censor us. But um, yeah, you didn't really have a chance to get out here on uh, on the unemployment numbers, um, but there was opportunity to get out in the bond market, which is another um, factor we're looking at for tail risk events. Anyways, this number has already started to climb. We can already see it's in an uptrend. Um, if we see any major pumps to the upside, you'll know that we're probably within, let's just say, two to we'll say one to six months of some kind of major potential of, of high potential for crash. Um, we'll look at bonds in a second. Uh, we did get new inflation numbers. The producer price index in blue bumped up. I mean, okay, th this is nothing, right? It's, it's just the same. Basically, we've hit the sticky part of inflation. They're going to have a hard time getting the CPI from 3% down to their 2% target. Um, the core inflation is still slowly, slowly moving down. So right now, this is actually stability. That's fine. That's good. Um, uh, at least from the numbers that they report, even as screwed up as they are, like at least <laughs> at least their screwed up numbers are looking um, looking OK. Um, and inflation, like I mean, let's let's be real, guys, like and this is something people need to understand. Inflation, just because the inflation numbers come down, that doesn't mean that the prices of anything is going to come down. Prices are never going lower um, unless you get some like major, again, deflation tail risk event that just sticks around. Prices are never going lower for anything, but they're going to go up less quickly. So like people mentally are still readjusting for the new price of everything after the after the big inflation that hit. Um, but lower inflation just means that that the number goes up less quickly in terms of like the stuff that you need to buy for living your life. Um, but yeah, those numbers are never coming down. Um, but so because um, sorry, I'll take another little moment here. On Twitter, I see, especially with the degenerate maximalists, um, they'll be like, oh, hyperinflation, you know, and, and Bitcoin's going to a million or whatever. And, and yeah, and well, the, 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 the dollar's collapsing before our eyes. Look, look at the economy. And it's like, bro, like, can you still order shit off Amazon? Like, do you still have money? Is there still money circulating in the system? Um, are, you, are you still able to, like, buy electronics and go to the grocery store and get food? Are you, are you really at want for anything? Like, is there anything that you can't actually get it's like, no, the economy hasn't collapsed, and inflation is not in hyperinflation. Um, yes, people are still kind of readjusting mentally to the new numbers. And yes, a lot of people are really struggling out there um, because people are, have taken on a lot of debt um, to keep up with the inflation that's happened. But um, we're not – like, this is not hyperinflation. This is not the collapse of the dollar. Um, so anyways, but I mean, yeah, I mean, prices are high. Uh, I get it. Um, inflation is stabilizing, right? Over the over the course of the past year, we've seen inflation stabilize. Okay, um, bonds here are another item that we look at that we're going to be keeping our eyeballs on regularly because when we see violent moves in bonds, typically to the downside, when you see violent moves where bonds are starting to drop off and the Federal Reserve maybe starts lowering rates, that's that again is another major major signal to us that. Um, that we're getting close to some kind of tail risk event. And of course, when we start to see the yield curve inversion move back into positive territory and start moving to, towards the upside, those two simultaneous things, bonds falling off with the yield, uh, the yield curve inversion coming back to normal, that is a, a huge sign, a huge sign for us that, uh, that we're looking at tail risk event potential, um, which for me, like, hey, bring it on, you know, good tail risk event, whatever, Bitcoin crash, buy some Right, maybe refill my bags a little bit um, in terms of the risk assets as they crash. Um, you know, for me, that's to me that's kind of a good thing. Um, it's kind of a bad thing, obviously, in the sense that it screws a lot of things up. Um, you know, for other people. So I, I really don't want to cheer for that kind of thing, but that's really just like what the system produces naturally. Uh, okay, uh, last few things. We're looking at the reverse repos here. This is cash that's being parked with the Federal Reserve overnight. You'll notice that uh, this has been highly correlated with the bull market that we've seen as money's come out of those reverse repos. It's gone into probably risk assets, stocks, and crypto. We still got about $400 billion left of this before we hit the zero point, um, and hitting the zero point is definitely uh, a highlighting event in my mind. Um, so, yeah, you can see this is kind of like there's this curvature here where it's, it's slowing down. So maybe they'll be able to stretch this all the way into the November election, maybe, so that we can um, so we can reelect Sleepy Uncle Joe, I guess. When I say we, I don't obviously mean me. I don't vote. Fuck that. Um, but anyways, yeah, who, who knows, right? We'll we'll just keep an eye on that. Again, it's it's sort of like the synthesis of all the information we've just talked about over the past say twenty minutes. We're putting all that together. We're looking at all the different signs. We want to understand the total picture of the market. Um, we want to put our TA in context with what the macro liquidity situation looks like across the globe for the United States. 
Uh, right. You want to put all that together. Um, no, you don't want to look at any one thing when you're trying to understand the markets. You don't want to get tunnel vision. Um, okay. This is Dixie. I don't even know why we look at this chart anymore. Okay. Dixie's flat. You can see, as we've talked about for months, this thing is volatility. It's, it's um, collapsing volatility, right? Not collapsing price, collapsing volatility, right? So you'll notice that the highs and the lows are getting closer together, right? So uh, at some point, this, this chart is going to break one way or the other. My guess, the break of this pattern here is going to be correlated um, with the results of running out of a repos and um, and potentially that tail risk event we're talking about. Um, the reason that we keep, we keep talking about this tail risk event is because the pattern is abundantly clear. This raising of the interest rates, flat top of the interest rates, uh, and then down on the bonds, that is a pattern that we have seen since forever when it comes to market crashes and tail risk events. It happened at the end of 2019. Well, it really happened for the years leading into 2019, but it happened at the end of 2019, just before the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the stuff that they, that they tried to pull on us in, in uh, 2020. It happened in 2008, really again, 2006, 2008. It happened for the dot-com. Like this is the pattern that happened. So we keep talking about tail risk event because um, it's there. Like the tail risk is, it exists, it's there, it's present. It's not particularly poignant at this exact moment, but in a broad context in, in say like the, the one to four year time horizon, um, that this tail risk has existed since last year and, and people have identified it, which is why you kind of have the people out there. Um, you'll notice that there's people out there in the, in, in the trading price world that have been talking about this for a long time. And they're like, oh, recession's coming, recession's coming. It's like, no, not quite guys. It's just that this is a very long, long pattern. And it's hard for humans um, typically to be patient for the year's long time frame to be like, okay, it's coming. It's there. You know, we talk about it every week and they're like, well, it hasn't happened, bro. I don't believe anymore. It's like, well, no, no, this is, this is a very long pattern. We just, I want to hammer home how important this is for you um, so that so that when you're not listening to me or someone else that you could be watching this yourself and and just prepare yourself. Um, I even told my my dad um, this past week, I said, yeah, you know, markets are fine. Like, don't worry about it. But if we hit like a very sharp, um, higher probability of an immediate tail risk event, like in the near future, I'll let you know. And one thing, like if you guys are on traditional markets, this is Monerotopia, so you're probably not. But if you are on traditional markets, one thing you can do is take like a far out of the money put on like the NASDAQ or or some like highly correlated asset, um, like a far out of the money put that expires in like a year, right? Or nine months or something. Um, and then you might put like half a percent of your net worth onto that. So that if some like if some crazy shit goes down, right, that thing's gonna go up a lot and you're gonna protect a lot of your stack. And if it doesn't, right, if you're wrong, well, okay, half a percent, you're not really gonna miss that. Um, you know, the rest and it, it, say the market keeps on rising, you know, that that shouldn't matter too much for you. Um, so even something small as that can really protect you during those those big um, risk off moments. And that way you don't have to keep a lot of cash on the sidelines either, right? Because otherwise, like you have to be like, well, I think the market's done going up. I'm going to sell my stack. And then the market keeps going up. And you're like, well, shit, okay, I'm, I'm out of the market here. Um, so that's like one, that's one strategy that people can think about. Talk to your financial advisor. Um, uh, give me a call. I'll be your, your financial advisor. I am your financial advisor, bro. Um, no, no, I'm not. Please don't, please don't, please don't, don't make that your takeaway from the show here. Um, I'm due drawing lines on a chart. Um, okay, guys, I think, I think that's about it. Maybe we could take a look at the NASDAQ really quick. Um, NASDAQ and, and S&P. Uh, so the NASDAQ is at the bottom of this channel. Technically, it's slightly broken down from this channel here on the daily close on Friday. Um, Breaking down this channel wouldn't be good, but that doesn't mean that the game is over, right? But that that will be like that would be kind of a a little bit of a sign, right? Breaking down from this channel. The next the next stop would probably be this area here if we really did break down. The Nasdaq loves 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 to break trend lines um, slightly, and then you can then come back into them. Like right here, down here, you can see like it broke for a single day that trend line, and then came back up. I don't know why, but traditional markets really love that. Probably probably because traditional markets are more efficient. Um, than crypto markets. And I know that everyone is aghast that I just said that. But the reality is that traditional markets encompass a shitload more volume and players across the world and, and money and accessibility in a lot of ways. Um, maybe I shouldn't say quite accessibility, but I mean, it just encompasses a lot, lot, lot of stuff. And for the past like 50 years, the name of the game has been find a signal in the market, mathematically prove it, exploit the signal, make money. Um, and some some entities out there have been very good at it. So the thing is that markets are not perfectly efficient, and this is why people are like, oh, you think you can beat the stock market? You think you can beat 
all of the people that, uh, you know, all of the brilliant genius mathematicians and physicists that run these trading firms. It's like, well, listen, there's a lot of signal in the market and it can't all be found necessarily, like not all at once. So, like there's so much signal out there. And when these guys find signal, they exploit it. So that doesn't mean like they're not exploiting necessarily every signal that exists in the market. So yes, you might be able to beat the market if you can find a signal. Um, so the point is here though, that the traditional stock markets and TradFi, especially the ones that have lots of volume, um, those markets are significantly more efficient than crypto for the most part, because you have so many people in there looking at them. And when you get perfectly efficient markets, you lose any signals, you lose any patterns. But um, because markets are not efficient, and especially because they're manipulated to certain degrees, there is signal, there are patterns, they can be drawn out, and you can beat the markets. Um, but you know, you really do have to dedicate a lot of time and effort into doing so. You can't just like expect to, you know, like if you're new to trading, you're like you're the past six year, uh, six months or twelve months, you're like, hey, I'm going to trade. Like, don't expect that necessarily you're going to be able to beat the markets. Um, you know, going straight out the bat, like, um, I mean, it for it. it my first year or so, like if you go to my old Reddit posts on like XMR Trader, you'll see me saying like some ridiculous shit. And you're like, like I was completely mistaken about um, about a lot of things in the way that markets operated for for a decent period of time there. Um, you know, and the markets taught me, right? Like losing money taught me what the markets really do. And and being wrong about the markets teach you like, okay, you you like how to adjust, how to adapt, what's really going on. Um, and in a lot of ways it was it was doing that that sort of like really helped to break me free from the sort of little bit of maximalist mentality that I had um, when I got into Monero. Um, really, it was, it was Bitcoin maximal, maximalism, maximalish, I should say. I was never fully Bitcoin maximalist. Um, okay, so anyways, uh, yeah, enough, enough, enough ranting on, on markets and stuff. Um, let's see, S&P is still kind of in this channel here, but it's on the lower side of the channel. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's all I got for you guys today. That, that should be pretty comprehensive cover of, of everything that's going on. Um, hand the torch off back to Doug and Sunita. And Tux, right. sorry, I'll leave Tux out. Body, thank you so much, man. Hello, um, hello. So, 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 kind of. I know, I know you hate when I do this, but kind of in short, because uh, it was it was a little distracting for us over here. What do you see kind of happening in the, in the immediate with regards to Bitcoin? Because it feels like it's just kind of sitting on a sitting on a ledge or ready for its next takeoff. Um, obviously, that's the million dollar Bitcoin question, but. What's 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 your hunch with the direction things are are headed next for Bitcoin as it sits on this ledge? My incredibly scientific, mathematically and also <laughs> financial advisor perspective uh, is that we've got some pullback here on Bitcoin into uh, into this area right here along this like purple line. So um, potentially, let's just say anywhere between sixty three and sixty five thousand. Um, probably for the next week or so, we're going to see, we're not going to see too much, like don't expect too much performance here out of Bitcoin. Don't, don't expect too much performance out of the markets. Um, one thing I would like to see happen is, is altcoins start to run where Bitcoin is kind of like hanging out here. Um, and, uh, you know what, actually, you know, I'm, I'm actually about to go off the edge here and just like start, start another rant short term. I think Bitcoin's got some consolidation and pullback, uh, for the next week until we talk again next week. Um, and you'll have some alt occasionally altcoins here and there, right? Selected altcoins will pump here and there, probably. But generally, right. crypto needs to pull back. And before we lose you too, any new insights with regards to the increased transaction count for Monero? Uh, it's been sustained now for, I guess, like two weeks. Uh, I think initially everybody just thought it was a, a it was a blip and it would go back. Uh, obviously, we don't know if it's a spam attack or it's organic usage. But I'm just curious if you're have any new insights or thoughts with regards to the increased transaction count? I don't, I don't think that I do. I was kind of trying to run some, um, just like very napkin math here. Okay. So we started on March 4th. It's currently March 15th. So, uh, it looks like about 11 days now, almost two weeks that we've been in the hundred thousand area. Um, if you look at the moment that finance delisted, which is February 20th, we had 25,000 transactions. We bumped up immediately, basically, to 40,000. So let's just say 30,000. Let's say 30,000 was like our immediate post Binance. Like if you wanted to make the case for it's an attack, we would say 30,000 is the baseline level of transactions. And so someone's going to need about, I think it's like nine times that much if you really want to totally unwrap, unravel the train uh, in, a, in a deterministic kind of way. Um, so nine times 30,000 would be 270,000 transactions. We got about halfway there um, to 140,000. 
Um, so if this pulls back, like if we get any major pullbacks to like 80, 60,000 transactions, I'm going to have to take that as a sign that it's probably organic, that at least mostly organic. Um, yeah. yeah. Here, here's another thing that might be the case. There's ransomware, there's, um, there's hacks and attacks and whatnot. There's um, uh, poison outputs probably from some of these dark nets. My guess is that if someone wanted to attack the Monero chain to de-anonymize it, they're probably targeting specific outputs, right? My guess is they would they would try to um, they would try to put extra transactions on the chain that would specifically target um, particular outputs. Maybe I got to think about that some more, and I really would need to like follow up with um, with some of the guys that know the output selection algorithm better, you know, like Ruck or someone like that. Um, but if they could, I don't know if it's possible to try and target certain outputs, but they might be trying to target specific people and to try and keep track of certain outputs um, to track those guys down. They might not be necessarily trying to de-anonymize the entire chain. So, again, it's one of those things like low threat model actors like like us, like we don't have much to worry about. Like, OK, no one cares about coin cards that like, the department of whoever is not tracking your purchase of coin cards or um, or anything like that. Um, but if you're a high threat model actor, you know. You might take some extra precautions here. You might tread very carefully. So, if you're selling life-saving insulin in China uh, on the dark web, you know, be very careful <laughs> about, about what you're doing. 